pleasure to have a, a nice group for um, the next few hours. So you have a lot of handouts, and as you know, we're um, going to get into um, how to use uh, Teen Intervene with uh, teenagers targeting uh, mild, moderate drug using teenagers, the ones that perhaps aren't dependent yet. Although we'll talk about if you're in a clinical setting and you have severe end cases, is this something you could use at the front end of your uh, more intensive program? Because there's surely um, opportunity for that. So here's the topic areas I want to walk us through. As you can see, there is some background information. And then um, number three is really where we're going to spend most of our time, how you use Teen Intervene, the clinical applications of it. And then to help with processing, there's a case study I'll have you read in, and discuss in small group, and we'll talk about um, how that therapist handled that given individual using parts of Teen Intervene. And then some follow-up information for you about um, implementing and learning the program. So there is a, uh, some background that I want to get us through fairly quickly, and, um, but to remind you all of, of what the scope is of this work. So just so uh, we're clear on definitions, when I refer to adolescents, I'm talking about 12 to 19 year old, or roughly um, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, middle to high school age. We never thought about using this with college students. We thought about, okay, you've got a teenager who's living at home and they're in the throes of the typical life of a teenager. Not that it couldn't be used with a college student, but we didn't really think of that at the time. You know, so you'll see some of the, the content and the uh, focus um, is, is aimed at those kind of youngsters. I suppose if you had an 11-year-old that was using, you know, it's not like you couldn't use it, the teen intervene, but uh, sure we're talking about the typical teen years. When I use the term drugs, I do mean alcohol. So it's alcohol and other drugs, although if I get specific with substances, I'll try to be more precise. And by brief intervention, I am referring to that, that more brief uh, type of therapy that um, is short of something that might be called intensive, and it's surely more than um, just a sit-down chat. So it's, it's got that uh, kind of a sweet spot in the middle. We call it um, a yellow, kind of yellow flag technology for students or youngsters that meet a yellow flag score or a yellow zone score on a, on a substance use severity test, kind of in the middle, in between green and red. Okay, some background. You already know about um, the resources that I've talked about. The, uh, a summary again, three of them are books, and then there's the, um, now, different tips than what I mentioned this morning. So tips 34 and 35 are a little bit more specific to our interest in brief intervention technologies. So you have one that's specific on the brief therapy, brief intervention arena, and then one on using motivational enhancement and interviewing techniques. They were both written not thinking about teenagers, however. It's kind of an unfortunate thing, but um, still valuable. Provides some nice background. You're going to learn about, about motivational interviewing um, today. Um, so how brief is the brief intervention? It tends to be in that uh, two to four range. Oftentimes it's done when uh, in opportunistic situations. There's one model out there that's done in a single session with teenagers that are in emergency rooms because of a car accident that was related to their drinking and driving or intoxication and driving. You know, that's an opportunistic moment. You wait till the person sobers up. Before they leave the emergency room, you give them a one-hour brief intervention. That's, that's in the literature. It shows some interesting impact. Um, but brief uh, intervention for us is three sessions. So teen intervene is three. Two of them are individual with the teenager and one of them is individual with a parent. With the, the parent session, the idea is, though, to have um, a combination meeting with everybody for the last five minutes or so. But essentially, it's broken down like that. You'll, you'll see the logic of that pretty soon. And as I mentioned earlier today, we're um, trying to hit this, this middle range, mild, moderate teenager that we think is, however, prevalent in schools and clinics, pediatric settings, 
a lot of mental health settings as well, where a teenager's got a problem with depression or something, but they, the, the drug use might be mild. Um, one could use it in intensive treatment as supplement. It could be a, it's a good front end activity in an intensive program because Teen Intervene works on trying to build problem recognition, trying to build rapport with the counselor in a teen brain friendly way, um, working on what's important about um, health behaviors and how a, a, a new approach to life in, uh, should be something the teenager should, uh, needs to think about. So, you know, a lot of good front end activities that then could help you grease the wheels for a teenager moving into your more intensive program. And as I um, mentioned earlier, um, um, there's probably a certain percent of teenagers in any given um, community that might fit our definition of mild moderate. Um, this was one way we've looked at the data whether it's abuse diagnosis or whether it's heavy drinking short of abuse or whether it's starting to use illicit drugs but still doesn't meet abuse criteria, you might consider all of those um, worth our attention, worth intervening. So this approach tends to um, challenge or perhaps um, bring into question some standard counseling philosophies. Um, hopefully there, these are challenges that are still um, within your wheelhouse of interest and things you can accommodate. Um, it does view substance use though on a continuum and realize that um, it has a functional value for individuals and to tell somebody who has a strong habit of doing something that they now need to stop and be absent right away can be a big challenge from a behavioral change perspective. So um, you'll see how we play this out with Teen Intervene, trying to shape the youngster towards the goal of abstinence. Um, but it's not heavy handed with abstinence um, up front. I don't think that has to enable the addiction process. I think that's capitalizing on uh, shaping principles from um, behaviorism. But it's, it's something you have to think about. You've got to um, see how you uh, feel comfortable with it. How does that play out in your, in your clinical setting um, and with your orientation? So I, it, there's flexibility in how you, of course, apply these technologies, and you get an option to also apply them with some flexibility, given your orientation, your context, and your clinical setting. You may know there's this um, growing trend of looking at brief interventions, and they're favorable. Uh, in terms of effectiveness. The, the LIPSI meta-analysis highlights some of them. Um, these are some of the articles that have come out in the last few years. The extent to which they're commonly implemented in clinical settings, I don't think um, um, uh, is, is impressive yet. Um, it's still a challenge to get uh, major um, counseling centers or health managed organizations to to implement them, in part because you're looking at trying to prevent escalation of a mild problem. And a lot of health systems do not have the resources or the, or the orientation to do that. They're waiting until the problem is severe, because they got limited resources, and they're already got waiting lists for severe cases, so they, they don't have the opportunity or the wherewithal um, to stretch out their public health uh, intervention model. So it's a, it's a bit frustrating. It seems like this, though that it's a missed opportunity um, because we're, we're hopefully, if uh, effectively intervening early with young people, we're preventing some of them from escalating. More on that later. Um, so why do we think and, and why does the literature tend to, to suggest brief interventions um, seem to be pretty good for teenagers, seem to be, at least uh, if, if you can apply them, adolescent friendly? Um, here's, here's four things that, that come to mind. In many ways, we're dealing with a problem level that's not as deep-rooted yet in the person. So a briefer intervention or the minimal dose might actually be more effective, as opposed to somebody who's got a more deep-rooted more uh, or a stronger habit in their repertoire. Um, motivational enhancement is very person or client-centered, not um, therapist-centered, so the, uh, the whole notion of that you're not um, dictating 
you're not prescribing the plan to the teenager, but in other words, you're more like a coach, a mentor, you're, it's a two-way street, you're working with a teenager, you're trying to have a lot of input from him or her, all of that tends to, I think, break down the natural barrier that the teenager has of, you're an adult, you're going to tell me what to do, and I'm not too happy about that, as opposed to, no, we're engaging you, Sally and Tommy, um, uh, help me think this through, tell me more about what you want to do, how you see things being more client-centered, I think, is appealing to young people. Um, getting teenagers to say, okay, I will agree to brief number of sessions is probably easier than getting them to commit to behavior change when they might be asked to commit to a much longer form of therapy. You probably will find with a certain percent of youngsters when you work with these type of therapies, brief, that you actually are opening the door to the teenager to something they want to do in a, on a longer term. Um, arrangement. So we have a lot of youngsters that say they're, they wish the, they didn't have to stop after the two sessions and they'd like to do more. And, um, but they, who knows if they would have agreed to a long-term program at the, at the front end. So it's a bit of a door opener, hooking them into the process and for some young people they may find this is um, a very rewarding experience and they're actually interested in continuing with you. Perhaps some of you see youngsters in opportunistic settings, or you can set up opportunities for that. Um, there, there are surely some clinics that are seeing youngsters that are engaging in high-risk behaviors, and that's why they're there, and thus drug use might be lurking. Perhaps that's an opportunity to introduce this kind of program. If there are school clinics in communities, that's another opportunity, or school counselors that at least have perhaps uh, an opportunity to engage in more than just academic counseling, but behavioral counseling, um, this might be seen as opportunistic. In Minnesota, we've benefited from the school health culture. There, school health clinics, formal ones, are not as common uh, as they may have been. But there's a lot of uh, interest in Minnesota schools to deal with uh, chemical health issues. So we, we've been able to benefit from that because we can get them trained and they're interested in these programs and they have staff and resources to do the interventions. Um, but that, that could be a rare situation, I'll be the first to admit. I think in many standard clinics, um, if you're a mental health clinic or a generic outpatient counseling clinic and you're getting referrals for typical adolescent problems, which might be ADHD, conduct disorder, or maybe at school problems, truancy, et cetera, um, drug use uh, might be lurking behind the curtain and um, this technology may be of value to you as, a, as an adjunct to what you're going to be doing else, else with, the, with the youngster for those other problems. Just a reminder, um, keeping in mind that the um, adolescent brain development being what it is um, means you want to be thinking about tweaking your approach to be um, teen brain friendly and I think um, motivational interviewing skills as well as brief interventions uh, do accommodate that. I think it is interesting when you think about brain development, um, how our culture, though, gives uh, many rights and privileges well before the so-called end point of maturation. Um, a lot at 16 and 18. Now, 21 I can put up there just because we changed that from because of the public health data that indicated if we move minimum age of drinking at 21, we'd probably save some teenagers' lives by a drop in the um, traffic accidents, the fatal traffic accidents. So that data was emerging in the 80s, and you might know then the states were incentivized to go to 21 because the federal uh, government said they wouldn't get all their highway um, dollars, federal highway dollars, if they didn't. And that has had a nice impact. But it's interesting, if we hadn't had that movement, there'd still be a, probably nothing after age 18. Uh, that was a, a milestone. However, there's a quiz for the group. There is something in our culture that draws a line in the sand at 25. Oh, we have an answer. Car rental. Thank you. Excellent. Renting a car. I just had to rent one uh, the other day and even though I don't think I sound like I'm in my 20s, she asked the question on the checklist, are you at least 25? And um, so why is it? Did they have neuroscientists working at Avis? No. <laughs> they didn't. They, they've been doing this before we even knew about the neuroscience. But if you look apparently at 
um, traffic or highway driving data of young people, you see an interesting improvement at age 25, particularly amongst males. So uh, the car industry sees that data dramatic enough that they've, uh, they figure that it's, uh, it makes sense from a business model even to wait till 25 to give young people cars. It's not that 24-year-olds 20, don't want to rent cars, they do, but um, that's, that's an issue. So congratulations, you get first in line for lunch, or at least first out of here to get, get to lunch. Um, and I, I've shown you this, just uh, one of the reasons we might look at uh, adolescent development from this neuropsychological perspective is because uh, brain development is occurring in this interesting way. With uh, generally the break regions of the brain or the prefrontal cortex maturing a little bit later in the teen years, relatively so, compared to the so-called accelerator regions of the brain that are more related to emotion, motivation, reward, incentive-driven behavior, that tends to mature a little sooner. And those regions tend to be in the back or the middle of the brain. So this brain development, uh, they say, even though it's kind of got an enveloping uh, process to it, is tends to be back to front. Um, and so the more um, primitive regions of the brain are more in the back, and the more advanced are in the, in the front prefrontal cortex, and our primitive regions get, um, get, ma get the maturing process done sooner, where our seat of sober second thought is, tends to be last. Um, hopefully you will see how brief interventions, including Teen Intervene, tries to capitalize on some of the tendencies that we see in the adolescent, in part because of brain development, interest in activity, interest in um, um, uh, high excitement activity and low effort, um, um, helping the teenager modulate their emotions. These are all a phenomenon we tend to see um, uh, in the teen years, as well as propensity to engage in risky behavior and planning that isn't uh, perhaps optimal. And uh, we try, even though it's brief, to, um, to work with a teenager on how they're thinking through things, how they can um, do a better job of decision making and not be so heavily influenced by context. One sidebar, what is a big context for teenagers that's related to health? <clears throat> that's not drug use, of course that is one. And you, as we all know, the um, drug use and teen behavior is unfortunately got a, got a big relationship. In fact, you could probably um, get as accurate data about a given teenager's drug use if you just ask the teenager about the drug use by their friends. You know, maybe a person sometimes doesn't want to self-report. They might get a little defensive, right? But yeah, do an end around and, and ask the teacher, well, just tell me about your friends. So, you know, what are they like? Do they, they occasionally, you know, just throw in, occasionally use, see if you can get, you know, the odds are the teenager says their friends use, you, your, your, your teenager in front of you probably is, has also used. Um, but a um, significant uh, influential contextual factor on teenage behavior is when teenagers are a passenger with a new driver. And people think brain development is part of the problem. As you may know, there's a lot of inc great increase in accidents among teenagers if they have friends w in the car with them, particularly in the first six months or year of driving when they're new. And uh, there's laboratory measures that kind of show this, this peer and effect. Adults do better of ignoring a passenger, a friend sitting with you while they're driving, than a peer. Um, but without peers, uh, teenagers drive just as well as adults. They've shown this in the laboratory. You can do these simulated tasks. So it's an interesting uh, phenomenon, peer influence, probably interacting with the brain, not able to handle distractions or the excitement or the energy or however you want to look at it, as well as an adult brain. And that might be at play at what goes on out in the environment, teenagers drifting towards delinquency, teenagers drif drifting towards other risky um, health behaviors like drug use, sexual promiscuity, etc. cetera. Um, contextual factors, likely social and peer, are, are, are at play. Something we try to um, interject into teen intervene, getting teenagers more aware of it. So just to summarize, possible uses of uh, brief intervention, any brief intervention with teenagers, it could facilitate referrals for additional specialized treatment. So uh, you may have a teenager that has multiple problems and you want to start working on something with the teenager. You could start with a brief intervention looking at the drug use issue. This could be something that is, uh, accommodates the referral for somebody for other problems that, that either you are going to learn about when you're working with a teenager on the drug use issues or you may already know about but you decided to start 
with something um, like this up front in the hopes that you can convince the person as well as the family. There might be um, a need for more specialized treatment later. Perhaps you have a waiting list, and you, but you have enough resources to handle people on the waiting list at a brief intervention level. That could help bridge that time. As I mentioned, people use some of these type of technologies at the front end of intensive treatment in the hopes that they're improving problem recognition, moving that teenager from pre-contemplation to, to um, preparation and action. You could insert many of these techniques in the middle of intensive treatment, as could be routine, or you could do it if you're seeing progress uh, not go so well. Um, you might want to jumpstart the person's motivation, realize, hey, yeah, maybe I should use uh, the following technique. Time to redo decisional balance, for example, or time to get the person to sit down, I'll do a real intensive motivational interview because just things aren't working with our usual program. It may, may need to jumpstart somebody, again, uh, towards uh, preparation and action. And it could be a standalone, and that's sort of how I'll talk about it today and uh, thinking of it as, all right, you've got a teenager in that mild, moderate zone, an opportunity to, um, to engage that youngster in a behavior change process. Okay, a chance to um, see if I can get the group to join in a little discussion with me. This is a chance for a large group exercise. So um, you know a little bit about where I think Teen Intervene is of value and where it could work clinically. Um, but, you know, to some degree, it's, it's not the, perhaps the first best option with teenagers um, that, however, have certain problem configurations, certain problem issues. So let's just think about this top group here. Imagine you're running a long-term residential treatment program, and you are running it because there's a lot of kids where that makes sense. It's a good match for certain kids in your community that need long-term residential. So what kind of drug use pattern might you see in a teenager? You know, what kind of drug use history, if you did an assessment on such kids, that where it would make sense? Oh, they need long-term, perhaps even residential treatment. What might you see? Addiction. Uh, no. Addiction, exactly. You're going to you see dependence criteria met. If you did DSM-4, you'd see um, uh, dependence met. Uh, or features of loss of control, preoccupation, maybe even physical withdrawal symptoms. Tolerance, exactly. The signs of addiction. What else? might you see in terms of drug use pattern? Harder drugs. Exactly, more harder drugs. Moved past alcohol, maybe even past marijuana into uh, the amphetamine categories, the psychedelic, et cetera, exactly. Okay, for psychosocial problems, the other problems they might have in their life. What, what are things that, that are related to teenagers functioning, either their personality or environment, that tend to be so severe you realize, wow, that person might need some intensive work. Access to, access Ex to, uh, to drugs? In the community. Yes. yes, or at home. What if you got the, there's, there's heavy use by siblings and parents, and there's a lot of access, exactly. So protecting them from the access by the residential. Actually, I meant access to personality disorders. Oh, oh, personality disorders. Oh, there you go. Well, exactly. <laughs> so what are some personality disorders we see in young people? Antisocial, or, or at least the uh, conduct disorder type. Sometimes you see um, the early version of borderline. Exactly. Um, we also see sometimes psychotic-based, you know, problems with reality. It could be personality disorder, schizotypal. Might not be the psychosis yet, but exactly. So significant personality problems. Exactly. What else? What else might you see? Court involvement. Yes, already court involvement. They're already crossed into a lot of illegal, particularly if it was they just didn't get caught unlucky for a minor thing, but what if it's significant? Already, you know, violence is involved in the, um, or use of weapons in, in the, uh, the behavior that led to court. So you can see, and we could talk about comorbidity, what if you had clinical level ADHD or past just a personality that's about delinquency, but they've, you know, really easily meet conduct disorder. Depression. And depression. Um, so, for example, you, you, may, you may know this if you work in the field, the, um, on average, teenagers will have um, an onset in their teen years of either depression or anxiety disorders more frequently than they'll have onset of a substance use disorder. If you were to take substance use disorders, anxiety, and depression, think of those three disorders, 
and then think about, so when do people on average you know, have these emerge if you're going to have it in your life? Well, anxiety and depressive disorders have earlier onset um, by, gee, about six, seven years on average than substance use disorders. So if you work in the world of child adolescent uh, counseling or child adolescent psychology, um, on average you're going to see more anxiety and depression out there than you'd even see uh, substance use disorders. Anyway, um, and if at the clinical level, that might mean, you know, uh, intensive. You all know ADHD, anxiety, depression, they are in many ways continuous phenomena. We have diagnostic criteria that has a line in the sand that says, okay, you have the disorder. You get a code and blah, blah, blah can happen. But you may also know or should appreciate that uh, many people fall just short of that diagnostic criteria. We call them subclinical, mild, moderate cases. They have problems. They have issues. It's mild, uh, but it doesn't mean that you go from full ADHD to none or full conduct disorder to none. Uh, there's many uh, mild cases in between. These are clinically, you work with a lot of youngsters, you may see these emerge. Um, mild versions can be handled you know, with perhaps a lot um, less intensity than the, the more severe versions, but always useful to to measure these things in a clinical setting and to think about them uh, as dimensional concepts. Even though somebody doesn't meet the criteria, it doesn't mean you don't have to necessarily deal with, so, so what is a you know, mild version of ADHD, subclinical? What do you, problems might they have? Well, they still might have learning issues, school functioning issues, because they still might have some attention problems. They still might engage in a bit of impulsivity and still get pulled into some uh, unhealthy decisions. Um, Moderate version of, chem, of a conduct disorder. Well, they, they might still um, color outside the lines when it comes to rules. They might still lie a lot to their parents. They might still, you know, tend to engage um, or hang around youngsters that also are, uh, are delinquent, which could escalate it later on. I think, question, no. Okay. Um, so just a slide to remind you of some cautions. You have severe end cases. You wouldn't necessarily try a brief intervention at the front end. Um, um, if you do uh, find coexisting problems when you're doing a brief intervention, you might realize you've got to supplement that with additional referral or treatment that you're doing yourself. And keep in mind, uh, non-absence goals, which we'll talk about, which are common in brief interventions, may not be suitable for your own um, clinical perspective or in the setting in which you work. I just as a sidebar, um, schools where we're, we do our work, um, and research know that uh, this is a model that doesn't necessarily end with a teenager abstinent. And while we're, we talk about abstinence as a goal, we also have um, moderate um, or intermediary goals that are not abstinence with some teenagers. Schools have not found that to be a problem so far. We don't get complaints from parents saying, uh, why is, well, how, how can you be doing this? Um, it, it's, we've been interested by that. I may be surprised to some degree because I think we thought there, there, uh, we might have some challenges on that level. Um, I don't know what to make of that. Is it <laughs> reality out there is, is such that people realize, hey, if you can get a person just to improve, uh, we know uh, a lot of teenagers aren't going to go absent, and so any, any improvement in a positive direction is, is, uh, is helpful. That might be a mindset that we're able to, uh, to benefit from. Um, I think it keeps teenagers engaged. I think it, with the shaping principle in mind, we're, we're actually achieving um, um, better results and more abstinence in the long run with that process. But it is controversial, and you have to keep that in mind. Now, if you're in a juvenile delinquency or juvenile court setting, you might have to have only abstinence on the table because that might be the judge's um, condition, and it could be a violation of parole if they're non-abstinent. And there's just the reality. You uh, work up front with a teenager and say, well, here's, here's the cards you're dealt with, Tommy. Um, if you don't pass your urine screens, they're going to be random. You know, then you're going to go back to judge and bigger penalties are going to occur. So we're going to have to talk about how to, to get you drug-free starting now, blah, blah, blah. And that's, you know, sometimes you have to overlay that reality. Okay. So let me move to the second unit, which is just um, talking about some basic principles um, related to um, the ability to do teen intervene. These are principles that I hopefully would help you in all clinical settings, even if you don't use 
the intervention, um, a little bit on assessment, um, a reminder that uh, it's good to think about using standardized tools to try to help you figure out you know, who's, who should be considered a severe case and may need specialized versus who might be in the middle. And you know, assessment hopefully is, is uh, rigorous enough so you get a dimensional score and you can figure out um, you know, who, who's crossing this line or who's, who's in that zone but who might be crossing to the right there and in another zone. Um, this turn out okay? Well, it's, I'm not sure your printout version um, was coherent. I had, to tweak, I had to tweak my slide, but this is um, just a reminder that assessment can vary from something very brief like five minutes to something we might call a screening that perhaps is about 30 minutes, maybe up to an hour, and then if you do comprehensive, it can be longer. Maybe, many don't have luxury to go past an hour for comprehensive assessment, they're the first to admit it, but if you want to really get into in depth um, a teenager's underlying coexisting disorders, and you want to try to go through systematically diagnostic criteria for the major developmental disorders, using even a structured interview, even computer uh, assisted that can help you with your efficiency in it, it still takes a lot of time if you want to go down that road. Um, so that can be several hours. Um, but hopefully you have at least an hour where you can do what I'll call a, a, an intensive, <laughs> expanded screening. Um, you're not going to have enough time to go in great depths uh, of all the psychopathology that might be lurking, but you have an opportunity to, to measure drug use uh, severity and, and related consequences um, pretty rigorously. Maybe you can get the parents' point of view. They know some things, obviously. Uh, they, some things they, they, they're not going to be good resources for. Um, and hopefully you can get a picture of the teenager's environment, their personality. And, and there's some of those good measures that um, I like uh, can help you with that and make um, uh, things go efficiently. A reminder, tips number 31 uh, uh, provides a, a nice free resource for tools. Um, there also will be a, a slide that will be inserted in, into um, today's talk that will give you the sources of all of my favorite tools. They either give you the emails or the websites for how you can um, get more information about the, the favorite screening and comprehensive tools um, that are on this list. It's, and many of them are public domain, so the, uh, you'll be able to get um, uh, from the website the actual instrument, but some of them where it's, it's a cost item, you have to go and uh, get information either from the publisher or the author. But we'll provide uh, the contact information, source information, for all of these, so if you're interested. If you want to know which ones I like even better, because I like them all here, you know, that's kind of a big list, feel free, you can email me and ask, so among the screening tools, Winters, which one, you know, um, I only can use one, which one should I use, and I don't have any money. So, oh no, I have a dollar and a half per person, per client, which ones could I use? Now, and you do get more, sometimes with a dollar and a half item versus a free one, but the public domains one are often pretty good as well. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the craft, as you know. Um, these six items, two or more, um, suggest the need for a brief intervention. Somebody had five or six, it might suggest need for more, but um, two or more yes is likely suggest. You, of course, could do this in interview format or turn it into your own paper pencil and have the true-false uh, option there for the teenager to respond to. Sometimes teenagers are more comfortable, if they don't know you, very well yet, you haven't established a lot of rapport in filling out privately a questionnaire, either on a computer or a paper pencil, as opposed to being interviewed. They don't know you very well, you might not get as much self-disclosure or openness uh, when asked these kinds of questions, and sometimes you get more or richer data from a, a self-administered version. So my other tool, just the second one, has to do with general principles about um, skills related to motivational enhancement, um, related to motivational interviewing, but there's, uh, there's other features to this. So I have three um, principles um, that will, um, that are, are based, form the basis of my, uh, my definition of, of enhancing motivation, gauging the client's stage of change, engaging in a general non-confrontational interview, and then even refining that more with using the 
um, the five principles of motivational interviewing. So we're going to walk through each of these three, give you some of the background and the logic behind it. So the notion that uh, we all vary to some degree on our interest in change means you, it behooves you to figure out where is your client's level of motivation. And based on that, you would modulate some of your next steps. Um, and so you may know about this model uh, from Prochaska and DiClemente. Um, the way to start reading it, because it's a, it's a circle, is uh, think about here, pre-contemplation. This would be rock bottom, worst case scenario. You've got a client who hasn't thought anything about change yet. And so they um, um, apparently have minimal uh, motivation to want to change. Um, as you move clockwise, you're getting a more advantageous situation. Contemplation, oh, the person's thought about it. They maybe haven't done anything yet, but they've at least considered it, maybe discussed it. Maybe they made promises, I'm going to quit smoking tomorrow type of thing, but haven't tried anything yet. That would be contemplation. That's a little more favorable, isn't it? Preparation means the person is preparing to change. They've already made some changes. Um, I'm going to not go to the following events where I always drink. I'm going to change the friends I hang around. You know, you're starting to plan for it. And action means you're, in, you're heavily engaged in change. You want to get your client to action. Hopefully by the end of the brief intervention, you got some action uh, with your client. Um, the call-outs here, they refer to uh, the mix of motivational enhancement and treatment strategies based on where your client is. So if you have someone in pre-contemplation, you don't do any treatment goals yet. The idea is you would just use motivational enhancement techniques to get the person to a more favorable situation, at least contemplation, then you can start to think about treatment. So, worst case scenario, you know, the better. This is my joke slide on, on teenage clients. If we were to think about the, the pie, it's not equal. For teenagers, it's mostly pre-contemplation. I'm just my, uh, my facetious reminder that you uh, probably have a lot of clients in the, that are teenagers that are mostly going to be pre-contemplation. So you've got to work on enhancing motivation. So that means your, a lot of your task is, is centered on this. So when you have somebody in pre-contemplation or low level of motivation, then your task is, is uh, heavily related to raising doubt. Now what do we mean by raising doubt? Raising doubt about their current behavior. Raising doubt that what they're doing is not a problem or what they're doing is okay. Um, so that can mean increasing their risk perception, their view of consequences. Hey, how does the teen brain handle that? So you know a little bit about the teen brain. Is this a silly task to try to educate teenagers about risk? You think it is? It is difficult. It is not, however, an um, unfruitful task. It turns out the, they've done studies on this. The, the adolescent brain is not compromised in perceiving risk. They just start, you can make a case, don't care about <laughs> whether the risk Im, impacts their decision making. So, it, so it's good to talk about the risk because it is something the teen brain can handle and is receptive to and might even have some affinity for. Of course, you have to help the teenager now make the connection of how that might be important to how you think about your lifestyle, your behavior, the decision making you're making. That's where the problem is. And biggest problem is the context, the teenager's life. Some of it is things you can try to control, some will be very difficult to control, it tends to contribute to not caring about the risk. So adults in a certain context with their friends don't lose the big picture about risk. Teenagers when with friends, they tend to lose the picture or the salience of risk and then just go with the flow of, of the context. Anyways, it's, our, it's the big developmental difference. But the good news is they understand risk, so it's okay to get in discussions about it. Well, they do understand risk, but not how it applies to them. Right. The you know, point made... Like Superman kind of... Yes. Superwoman kind of relief, but that it's never going to happen to me. Good. You've raised another good point um, about uh, teenage perception of risk. It, because of the perhaps narcissism, natural narcissism of... Uh, uh, of the teenage um, uh, brain and, and lifestyle and view of the world. Uh, I'm immune from these problems. These can happen to people. Yeah, that would be dangerous, but it uh, won't happen to me and, and even 
no, no, my behavior isn't contributing to it, even though it might be, exactly. So they can, um, don't, don't personalize it or view the uh, personal risk as, as much as an adult brain would. Prefrontal cortex, not weighing in as much, perhaps. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's not an um, uh, irrelevant uh, task to uh, discuss risk and um, how it, it could be relevant important to a teenager's life. More on that later. You'll see how we try to do that with teen intervene. Um, if you have somebody in contemplation, hey, that's pretty good, and then you are starting to push the person further along because they've started to think about it. You, you, know, you reinforce the fact they've already thought about it. You see if you can even um, have the person articulate more about why they might want to change. So you've thought about it. Tell us, tell us more. Tell me more about why you've, you've, uh, you've considered it. What are some of the advantages if you were to change? What are some of the disadvantages if you didn't change? You know, you said you've thought about it, but what if you just stayed on the course? Do you see any disadvantages of that? See if you can get, you know, some interesting answers. Of course, you reinforce the good ones and see if you can tip the balance towards um, more favorable response if you're not getting it. Uh, hey, if you're, if you're fortunate, then you plug in <laughs> basically session two of Teen Intervene where you're doing all the skill building and coping strategies and you're helping the person move along. But here you're, they're, in, they're in action. Um, uh, you're, you're, uh, you already have a, uh, have a, a favorable situation. Um, maintenance and relapse occur you know, when somebody returns. And of course, you might have that happen. Um, you could be doing teen intervene. Somebody relapses and comes, comes back. We'll talk about how you can use some of the uh, content from various sessions uh, to help um, get somebody back on course. Or if somebody wants booster sessions for maintenance, you could also uh, use um, various components. Um, just another way to look at um, what might contribute to poor motivation or contribute to better motivation. Here's um, a summary. On the left side are things that we want to um, um, try to address and correct. On the right are things we want to we'd want to try to promote uh, in our favorable direction. But um, there's a lot of of course, individual factors, aren't there? And what contributes to somebody being uh, low on motivation, someone being high? Um, so um, how, do, how to assess it? How to gauge it? We get pretty simple. Now, you could get fancy with some interesting measures uh, to tell you where the person is on that Prochaska de Clemente pie chart. We just uh, really ratcheted it down to um, give teenagers a scale on a 1 to 10. You'll see how we insert it in the program, but we found that you know it's uh, with just giving the descriptors of the endpoints and telling teenagers, tell us where you are, on one to ten, one being the worst, ten being the best. Uh, we're getting a ballpark, and uh, we get a lot of threes and fours in, at the first session, which we consider probably low, but not brutal, not not once. Um, maybe we're capitalizing on teenagers don't want to. They, they want to impress you that they have they're. They're, they're somewhat interested in being there, and they don't want to look like they're a loser and give you a one. Maybe we're benefiting from that. But anytime you get more than a one, you, of course, reinforce it, even if it's a two. It's better than one. And you, uh, you encourage the person to hang in there with you. So gauging is important. Um, Teen Intervene helps you with it with some, uh, with some techniques. Um, a general principle is um, also important for uh, promoting motivational enhancement is interviewing in a non-confrontational way. This is um, perhaps easy for most of us. Um, modern counseling techniques tend to be more of the non-confrontational type. If you perhaps had an older tradition, um, came through chemical dependency counseling programs from an older tradition, you, you might have um, uh, learned to sharpen your confrontational <laughs> techniques a little bit more. But um, just to reinforce um, the importance, I think, of a non-confrontational style. Now, this, this slide has three, three ways of asking a question that's not a good way. So take a moment and read them. So these are snippets of what are supposed to be more of the confrontational way of discussing a, a problem with a client. So how do you think this makes a client feel if you 
do you get this from a counselor? Defensive? Attack. Attacked, exactly. Yeah, um, somewhat hostile kind of uh, you know, language, and it's a little, um, a little over the top at times. It's, it's uh, into labeling. It's uh, maybe even accusatory. Um, not supposed to be uh, very <laughs> motivational enhancement friendly. You can see that uh, there's a lot of reason to expect this would be something to stay away from. Um, okay, this is supposed to be the more motivational enhanced way. So read these examples. So, why do you like this better? Because the word of using isn't in there. Okay, no labels, right? Staying away from labels. We need labels for, okay, researchers need them. I know you need labels for reimbursement <laughs> and maybe for communication. Sometimes it helps when counselors are communicating, but, you know, it, often you don't need them for, for the therapy sessions in the same way. What else do you like about this? Right, very client-centered, open getting open-ended and getting at some interesting questions that whatever answer you get, I think you can, you can get, start to build treatment entry points or intervention entry points. Even if you get stonewalled about what are some of the negative things, many teenagers perhaps, their biggest negative, they might say, well, I'm getting hassled by my parents. Can you help me get them off my back? You know, that's, that's um, you're not getting, you know, oh yeah, I, I'm screwing up grades. I'm on a pathway to addiction, Dr. Winters. <laughs> I know I, that dopamine uh, hijacking is going to happen soon. I'm worried about it. You know, you often, of course, you're not going to get those typically. You might get, you know, oh, I've got my privileges taken away. Well, that's good news. I mean, kind of good news because you've got leverage there. Um, I've got a boyfriend, girlfriend, or friends are starting to worry about me. That's in some ways good news because that's leverage. But you don't usually get biggies with the negatives, but you often get some great answers with the what are the benefits and treatment entry points, functional value of drug use is, is um, uh, a value to us and can help you um, start to shape some of the intervention goals. And the other two, the top and the bottom, they were you know, taking advantage of some information and finding out more about what was going on that also could be a value to you. The first one there, you know, if, you, if something's changed, whether it's gone up or down, or bigger or, or less, you know, you want to find out why because that might be important. What was going on in his or her life when your, your use increased? That could be interesting to you, important. Um, what concerns? Are there any? Maybe none. Maybe it's all external concerns. I'm just, you know, maybe it's not internal but still of use to you. Of course, it helps you kind of gauge, oh boy, I've got a client who's, maybe they gave me a one or a two on the scale, but, or, I'm sorry, they gave me a two or a three, but, you know, the kind of answers they're giving me suggest, oh boy, I don't know if, if they're motivated to do anything about their drug use. Are you stuck with that? Not necessarily. I'm, I'm gonna make a case for you that if you can get a teenager engaged in some change, even if it might not be, you know, the main goal of teen intervene, change drug use pattern, but being changed something else, um, there, you can be moving the ball forward. So hopefully you'll see how our, uh, our program helps promote this. Um, just to embellish some of this, on the left are some of the um, characteristics of more confrontational. On the right are characteristics of a, of a non-confrontational or motivational. You can see we've talked about a lot of them on the left, which are the negatives. Labeling creates defensiveness, assumes the client can't weigh in or help. Now, we have teenagers. I know they're not wise like we are as adults. They didn't get the degree that we got, and they don't have all the clinical experience of all the caseloads we have. But Guess what? When you're working with somebody who's a uh, drug user, who's, who knows the most about their drug use? <laughs> they do. Uh, so you want to take advantage of that. It's a part of their expertise <laughs> that they are unique about. And, um, 
and, and they do have some, hopefully, some insight. And you want to try to draw that out. Um, now, on the, the, the last, last line there is, um, is one I, I want to um, also reiterate. The idea is to negotiate goals and to work with the youngster on goals that are doable, reachable, realistic, that hit whatever sweet spot of motivation they have. Now, that might be at the very low, unambitious end. And the skill of a counselor is can you, even with the first session, nudge that person to something a little more ambitious? You know, maybe they say, I only want to do this, and it looks like they're stuck there. Um, can you nudge them to something a little bit more significant, meaningful? Or maybe you have to wait till the second session. Um, it's, it is part of the, uh, the skill of applying this, because you surely may have a lot of teenagers that, that stay, you know, with goal setting, um, perhaps somewhat trivial or, or unimportant in terms of health. Um, can, you, can you get the person to consider um, something a little bit more ambitious? Can you get them to negotiate with you something a bit more ambitious? Not prescribing it, but can you, uh, can you nudge them forward? It's, it's part of the challenge, but also part of the art of applying this. Okay, a discussion question for the group. We don't want to necessarily um, throw out of our toolbox our ability to be somewhat confrontational. I'll call it light confronting, or at least appropriate asserting, not mean, spirited, not hostile. But sometimes we have to ratchet up or turn the heat up a little bit with clients. And what situations with teenagers might, might that be the case? Where we might want to take out of our toolbox something a little bit more confrontational. What kinds of things might be occurring where you might want to plan? Yeah. Well, if they give you um, an indication that they do want to change and you write these things down as to what they want to change and then they go back and they don't do it. There you go. They go against right. it. Then you go right. back and you, you do the responsibility right. thing and say, right. I'm, I'm your coach here. Yeah. You said you were going to do right. this and now you're right. not doing it. So right. when they go back on their word, I would say that. Excellent. There's, uh, the progress is just not there. Seems like the client spinning his or her wheels. Maybe you're feeling like it's a waste of time. You're getting the talk, but not action and, and change and seeing. So how, in a, in a light confronting way, what might be the way you could approach that as a counselor? Well, I mean, basically <coughs> going back and reviewing and saying, well, you know, the last time you said there you, you were going to work go. on this and this and this. You know, how have you, you know, have you done anything towards yes. these things? Right. And say, well, if you really want me to support you, how can I support you? Right. Good. Achieving this. And Good. So you clarify what the story is. And then and I like what you said, too. You, you reflect on, for me to help you move forward, uh, we've got to have some progress. You've got, to, you've got to take responsibility for change. I'm getting frustrated with what's happening here because we're just blah, blah, blah. Excellent. If a kid would say, I, I really like the high I get from the vodka and the bar is mixed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, imminent risk, uh, very high risk, danger to life. Right. Where their, uh, their behavior is crossing a, a health line in the sand, and it's just, um, and I'll even throw in, okay, what if they're saying some other things about depression, suicidality, um, uh, where they're, they're, they're talking about things that are really significant clinical issues that, uh, you have to respond to from a from a rational health, sometimes mandated reporting level. Exactly, excellent. What else? I'm I'm fishing for kind of an uh, perhaps an unusual one, but just consider individual differences. I'll throw that out as a clue. What do you think I'm fishing for? Imagine you know people vary, all clients, all ages. They vary. Many ways. Anyone? Want to venture? What am I fishing for? You really get to go to lunch first if you get this one. You get to go ahead of the, <laughs> the person who got the 25 age. Mm -hmm. Yes? Maybe uh, when they're involved in some type of abuse. Okay, that won't get you lunch first, but that's a good answer. I was fishing for, you're right, anything that's uh, in the abuse category, physical, sexual, emotional, that's some of us that would fit mandated reporting, or whether the person's decision making is put him, putting them at a victimization level, and you have to you know, get serious with him or her about how they need to make some changes. It might mean reporting as well as just the, the ethical thing for, for you to do to alert the teenager, you can't keep doing this. You're getting victimized. You're enabling blah, blah, blah. Right. 
I am fishing for something sort of way out there. I'm really shooting for lunch. Uh, okay. <laughs> what if it's a kid from a cultural or personal standpoint is uh -huh. more amenable and acceptable to a more right. authoritarian person? Right. He's hit a home run. Okay. Yeah. That was what I was fishing for. You have to rule, can't rule out some people might respond better mm -hmm. to somebody who's more directive. And, and wants you to tell him or her what to do, and they, they're okay with that, they respond to it, it's quite possible. I wish I could tell you, I can predict who that is, how you could know up front. The, I think the theory is, you know, uh, motivational enhancement by and large is, is, a, is a better approach for most people. And, and builds the rapport sooner and opens up the doors of, of change um, bigger and sooner than the confrontational. But there, there are some individuals that uh, you, you could be directive. You could, you know, lay out the prescription. I think, Sally, you're going to need to do these three things. And, you know, of course, you could affirm whether that's working or not by, well, what kind of feedback you get when you throw that out there to the youngster, and then what kind of response you get and when you find out if he or she followed it. You know, you'd, you'd be finding out, hey, it looks like this is somebody who's um, okay with that approach. Of course, that doesn't mean, I don't know if there's anyone who really likes you are in denial, and every time you tell me something, I believe it's twice as bad as you're telling me, and, and you know, I mean, I'm, like yeah, right. I mean, I'm not saying that type of confrontational, as you said, authoritative approach by a counselor might be uh, uh, amenable to some some clients. Okay, so what if we if you do engage in motivational interviewing, the more formal parts of it? These are the um, five basic uh, interviewing approaches. They're all tend to be very similar. It's you know not creating defensiveness. You're kind of rolling with uh, any tension that occurs. Um, you don't care about whether you're winning an argument or not, <laughs> or whether your point of view is, is winning or not. Um, you allow the client, perhaps to have the last word. It might be one, one way of saying, allow the client to have the last word in a, in a given discussion point. Um, uh, in fact, the first three, you could probably say, are um, uh, fit this kind of an interviewing style that is very Rogerian. It's tell me how you feel. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. Um, um, you know, you, you being empathetic. If you ask stuff that you're getting some resistance on, you roll with it and either agree to disagree or move on or see if you can get the person to take another perspective. Um, you avoid argumentation. You just pull back when you know things are getting heated. Um, now, supporting self-efficacy. That's just a kind of the behavioral principle of anytime you get progress, whether it's verbally in your interview or whether you're seeing progress with, with, uh, with goals, you uh, make sure you reward it. Supporting self-efficacy, a fancy term for self-accomplishment. So, Because the old notion is you're building a client-centered culture in, in your session with your client. The responsibility is on the client for change. And they get to benefit from the change. And that's supposed to be more rewarding than if, on average, for most of us, we're just told what to do and we go do it. There's a, you know, it tends to be an extra boost in, in, uh, in motivation if a person realizes, okay, I'm going to take responsibility and I'm going to go do it. And then when you succeed doing it, you feel better, pretty good about it. When I get a golf lesson and the, the golf instructor corrects the flaw in my swing and then I go out and play around and I get a better score, well, after the round, um, I feel better when I kind of think about how I, yeah, I took that lesson and I, I incorporated it into my swing and I was the one that got the better score. Now, the odds are I probably should be thinking about the instructor who corrected the flaw, but you don't feel as good, um, even though there's an external source to, to the change. So you want to capitalize on that, and that's what supporting self-accomplishment is all about. Now, developed discrepancy is uh, in part used or comes from using the decisional balance exercise, which we'll talk about, but it's that, that advantage we have in kind of the drug arena where there's often a discrepancy between short-term gain of drug use and long-term consequences. Um, in, in, our, in this field, we have, to some extent, that leverage point because of the nature of drug use. It usually has short-term impact, but in many ways, for most of us, it's going to have long-term negativity. And so trying to use that as leverage to get the teenager to think about beyond the acute short term. Tough for the teen brain, I'll be the first to admit. Remember, they're, they're biased towards reward incentives. It's tougher for them to think about negative consequences, but um, uh, the principle here is to see if you can get the client to, uh, to recognize that and use that as leverage 
for change. Okay, so I have several slides for each of these that just give examples. I'll just um, walk you through them uh, quickly here. For example, expressing empathy, I have a, at the bottom is my uh, a typical quote. I can understand that it is tempting to use alcohol and drugs given that, that, you, that you do not like school. That's all it, oh, I can see why you're using because things aren't going so well for you. Understanding the client's perspective. Um, are avoiding argumentation. Okay, it looks like we do not agree on this issue. Let's move on to another topic. As a, as a good therapist, you can file that away and return to it later, especially when you might have a, uh, ooh, I just, the client just said something that counters what they were saying before, and I can bring that back to him or her and use that to get back to an argument, I'm sorry, a discussion that we were having <laughs> in the hopes that I can move it forward when I couldn't earlier. Um, and that's also where some light confronting can come in is I'm frustrated with what's going on here. Or, boy, I just don't see how you can say that, Tommy, because um, so many teenagers have blah, blah, blah happen to them. Whether you say, so many teenagers I've worked with, or so many teenagers I know, or don't you know that the probability of you getting blah, blah, blah downstream happened, you know, sometimes you can throw that out and see if it, um, that's a light confronting, throwing out a fact, uh, whether it's a clinical, um, based one or whether it's, uh, it's from science uh, can be a form of seeing how, how, how might the teenager react to that? Is that something that might have some input? By the way, like confronting also, I, I always look at as, as a chance to plant mustard seeds um, in a teenager. So I, I think a lot of times you're going to do things with, with a brief intervention with a teenager and you have to try to realize that, you know, I don't know if this is going to stick right now, um, but I, I'm hoping some of these things will be seeds that get planted that might bear fruit and have influence later on. You might not be around for that, and that's kind of the frustrating thing because you might not see the, the positives because the youngster's grown up or left the clinic setting. But um, don't rule out that um, even when you try some of these things, and you might look like you are just talking to nobody in the room <laughs> or you're, you're having to do a lot of the heavy lifting with, with the, the issue and you're just trying to squeeze some verbalization, some input from the teenager, it might be tough. Pulling teeth. Hang in there, keep doing it, because you want to see if you can be building you know, some script for the teenager in the positive direction, planting some of these, these uh, healthy mustard seeds that might, might work later on. Um, rolling with resistance. The yes, but, have you looked at it from a different perspective? Um, here's a a way to do it. It sounds like there are individuals in your life that really care about you that are very concerned. See what kind of um, input you get from that. Um, supporting self-efficacy. If you want to change, it really comes down to you wanting to make changes. I will help. You are the coach, the mentor, helping them um, with the change that they are going to implement and taking responsibility. And then this is the developing discrepancy, amplifying pros and cons in taking advantage of uh, um, sort of the phenomenon within the drug use arena of the short-term gain, usually long-term consequences. And we'll talk a lot about this because uh, we, uh, as you might expect, use it early on, the developed discrepancy exercise, and then use that a lot in goal setting. One thing I remind people, the odds are you will get some content, some input from a teenager, even the worst case scenario, when you ask the question, what are the benefits of using it? What do you like about it? Um, and thus the odds are you have an opportunity to at least establish one goal, treatment goal, and a homework assignment with the teenager. Now whether they'll engage in that homework assignment or not and improve, but the odds are it might be a short one hour session. <laughs> Maybe it isn't going to be the full hour. Because uh, they might not want to do much of the other exercises and, and they're not engaged much. But the odds are you, you, you will not leave that first session without something to get the teenager to work on that matches something they said earlier. So it's going to be at least consistent with what they said. So it would be hard for the person to, to say, oh, well, I don't want to work on that. That's not relevant to me. Um, in this developed discrepancy exercise, um, um, uh, provides you with that raw materials. So we are at a uh, very good break point for lunch um, because Unit 3 is really the, um, the meat and potatoes. We like to say that in Minnesota, the meat and potatoes 
of the talk where I'm going to walk you through all three sessions, um, how we uh, use all the exercises, um, how we use worksheets, etc. So you can see how it plays out. And then as I say, we, we, we uh, finish up with um, some application and um, um, uh, education uh, components. So hopefully you've been enticed enough about the program. You want to come back after lunch and you can, uh, you can get the, uh, the good stuff. <laughs>